Hi, friends. Welcome to another episode of Area 312 Rock and Metal Vodcast. And I'm one of your hosts, Kent, along with my co-host, Rex. Friends, today we have some very special guests among us. And I'd like to introduce first our guest co-host, and that would be from Heaven's Metal Magazine, one of the OGs, Mr. Doug Van Pelt. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, sir. And Friends, another OG from back in the day from White Throne Metal Magazine, a photographer and an article contributor, Mr. Darth Creek. Darth, it's great to have you back, sir. Good to be with you guys. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Darth, what was your official title with White Throne anyway? Well, mostly photographer. Um, okay. I, I never did any reviews as far as, you know, the demos that came in and such, but uh uh, kind of came out on the back end. So just mostly just photography, um, got to travel to festivals, met Doug way back in the day. Doug probably doesn't remember me because I was about 17 uh, cornerstone festivals back in the day. So uh, my first one was 89. And uh, it's kind of cool because we got to see the band that's our, our our guys today here, Paradox, live in 89 and Cornerstone. So that was the first time I got to meet a Paradox and also Doug. So it's, it's awesome. Wonderful. And that's a great segue, friends, into our very special guest today. May I have the privilege of introducing them. Their albums, Ruler and Power and Glory, are considered classics in the pantheon of Christian metal. And both of those albums bring equal parts power with the commercial flair. Their single, Meet the King, made its way onto the classic compilation, 1988's, uh, it was, uh, 1988's Underground Metal, I actually had that back in the day, one of my favorite compilations. And as, Nove as of November 2023, their 1989 recording, The Wrath, finally found its remastered release, courtesy of Retroactive Records. Friends, today from the band Paradox, we're welcoming lead vocalist Manny Castillo, and we're welcoming lead guitarist Fern Hernandez. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. <laughs> It's great to have you here. So a little golf clap there, friends. So guys, yes. <laughs> that's right. Manny and Fern, it's wonderful to have you. And we just kind of like to start off at square one. So to both of you, we'd like to ask, was there music in your home growing up, whether blaring from the radio or perhaps your family members perform music? Uh, go ahead, Manny. Well, for me, uh, music was a part because my dad was always spinning vinyls. He would put together a Gerard turntable. He recorded us one Christmas with a Gerard reel-to-reel, -reel, and we were introduced to music. Frank Sinatra, I remember falling asleep on the ground, on the ground, on the floor, and listening to Frank, uh, and. Um, I remember my dad got me my first 45 uh, player and he gave me uh, Willie Nelson and he gave me everything he didn't like, <laughs> which was kind of good for me because I got introduced to Richie Valens and, you know, La Bamba, stuff like that. And so music, yes, was very much a part of our family. So um, go ahead, Fern. Well, as for me, I come from a musical uh, family. My, I have two brothers that play um, musical instruments. Uh, one of them was a trumpet player, and the other one is a vocalist, uh, guitar player. And growing up, I'd listen to their, their music, which at the time I wasn't crazy about, but it was Spanish music. And then, of course, uh, there was always music in my house and I had to listen to to that. And at that time, I thought that was the only music that was around. So I started listening to the radio. And um, then my brother, my oldest brother brought in a, a couple of albums and I started listening to them and I said, whoa, what's this? And it was a rock. It was um, uh, one, one album I saw three guys on the album their faces and it was a uh, grand funk's album closer to home <laughs> and i was uh it was back in 69 and i, I must have been about 12 years old but it really intrigued me uh -huh. and from that point on it's history i threw away all my spanish songs spanish albums and i said that's what i want to do 
I love Grand Funk. They're one of my favorite bands of all time. I appreciate Mark Farner, you know, uh, mm -hmm. his his uh, stand for the Lord, and uh, absolutely love that old stuff. So that's that's awesome, Fern. Now, Fern, you play a main link guitar. Uh, I'm looking friends. We've got the albums Ruler and Power and Glory and the Wrath. Fern, you play a main link guitar. Were you self taught, or did you take lessons for Lee? Well, uh, believe it or not. I was self-taught, but as soon as I graduated from college, I mean, from uh, school, I went into college and I took a guitar course, classical course, because I didn't know how to write music. And I was there for about three months and I had to drop the course because I couldn't understand the theory behind it. I, I just couldn't get, get it. And uh, in fact, I got an F on the classical uh, course because he, he told me, he gave me an assignment to teach her the instructor and he told me go home and learn love me tender so i went home but i just picked it the way i play it i hear it and i went and i played it that day and he says well i'll give you an a for effort but i'll give you an f because that's not the way the song is played and i said oh yeah you're right so from that point on i never did get into you know music but i got into classical music but i never learned so the Lord basically was the one that opened up my mind to all these other music, and I I give him the credit, you know, I'm self-taught, but by him. I thought, Fern, that maybe the F stood for Farner, as in Mark Farner, like you were playing in the style of Mark Farner. So I was. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Believe it or not, uh, I was so into, into Mark Farner and Grand Funk that I used to tell my friends to call me Mark when I was in high school. <laughs> So they changed my name from Fernando to to Mark, and uh, but it, that that was a long time ago. Well, that's that's awesome. Now, now, man, I've got a couple questions for you coming up. But uh, Fern, do you what's your preferred guitar? Are you a Gibson man? Are you a Fender man? What's your preferred uh, guitar? Well, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it either way. I'm endorsed by Zion Guitars, and I love okay. Zion. Great, the great musical instruments, the boutique instruments. I have several of them, but uh, the one that I use on stage is uh, a Red Fender Stratocaster, and I have more of the other strats that I use. I use Gibsons, but they're not really my forte. I, I love them though; they're great. But I use uh, Fender Strats, and uh, now what I'm doing is uh, I'm putting together. I'm I'm just making them because I was taught uh, how to build guitars from a luthier. So now I know how to put them all together, fix up my own strats, and add whatever I want to. Wonderful. That, that's awesome. Yes, sir, Doug. Fern, what is that red Stratocaster's? What's her name? Her name is Rosie. She has a 17-inch a whammy bar. In fact, I was supposed to bring it, but I was running late. Like I said, I had some things I, I wanted to. But it's on my Facebook page. If you all go in, you can look at it. It's on my. I recently put it up. I get a lot of questions about it, but the reason it's so big was because at the time when I was younger, I used to play a lot and I was busting the regular Strat bars. And the, the man that taught me how to fix guitars, I was working at a music store, it was called La Costa Music uh, by Mr. Mike Acosta, who was the one that taught me. He said, well, why don't we go ahead and make you a thicker whammy bar? That way you don't bust them because you're you're always, uh, I'm always having to do these for you, Fern. So what he did is he, he grabbed a drill rod from, a, he was a machinist, he brought the drill rod and it was about three feet long. We cut it in half, give or take. And then uh, we drilled it and we bend it, but I was running late. It was already six o'clock on a Saturday. And I said, man, I have to be at the gig by eight. So we left it like that thinking that I was going to cut it. I said, well, I'll just cut it back Monday when I come back to the shop. And we never did. When I went there that time, everybody loved it. And they said, Fern, that's a great trick. And I said, well, it's not a trick. I just didn't cut it. You know, <laughs> that's what it was. The super whammy. <laughs> yes. Hey, Fern, did you play Rosie um, at Cornerstone 89 with that whammy? I did. I did. And that's where, if you hear the wrath, uh, that song, uh, Banner at War, it should be Banner at War, but they, I think they have it, Banners at War. We were playing at the time, and at the time it was the Afghanistan War, uh, the Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I think Manny and I talked about it and Manny said, hey, I think you should do something like the Hendrix type uh, Star Spangled Banner. And I said, yeah, you're right. And I did. I used several guitars, but uh, Rosie was the main guitar. And with that whammy bar, you can grab it uh, reverse wise and just pick it up and just do whatever you can. I do a lot of tricks with it at the time and the guitar would stay in tune perfect but uh and i don't know what it was about that guitar but i just love it uh but she's beat up she's beat up she's a good strike very good well that that beat up in this that's that's we call that character right firm right <laughs> yes. got a lot of character so yes, sir. rex and i never had the privilege uh where we were at in the time we we certainly listened to as many bands as we could but we weren't like doug or darth blessed to have a whole lot of Christian metal bands come by our way. So I'm curious, you know, I'm anxious to hear as we get through in the discussion, as we continue some things that uh, Doug and Darth have to say about Paradox Live and the scene at the time. Now, Manny, your vocals are soaring, and they're wonderful. You bring grit when it needs grit, and you can just soar when you want to. Um, I'd like to ask, Manny, were you trained vocally, or is that just your natural voice in what you do? Wow. Um, I have to say that um, when I was in high school, there was a band called uh, Waterproof Timepieces, and they were looking for a lead vocalist. And I thought, well, you know, why not try out, you know? Uh, and the song they wanted me to sing was Don't Let the Sun Catch You Crying, uh, which has a double meaning now. And uh, I went out, tried out for the band, and they said, oh, unfortunately, you didn't make it, you know? So okay. I was in Spanish class, and there was a guy named Dan Dreven, who is a drummer, and he said, hey, we're starting a band. We're going to meet at uh, Brackenridge Park and and uh, just come out. We have a little PA system. And they started playing some cream. Dun, 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 dun. And I thought, it's getting near dark, you know. And I started getting into this new style of, of rock that was coming on. And, and then uh, back in... Led Zeppelin with Robert Plant just took over. And I said, um, the same band evolved and became Excalibur. And we we would play these Battle of the Bands. And we always tried to do some things really neat. Well, Led Zeppelin had come out with Stairway to Heaven. And so Dan said, well, do you think you could cut it and do the high vocals? And I said, yeah, I, I think I can. So. We did it for the contest and we won three consecutive battle of the bands. And from there, I thought, man, I didn't know I had that high register. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, and I talked to you about it earlier, it was um, I started getting a lot of sore throats and went to a, a voice therapist and uh, Dr. Fobri, and he was about 83 years old and and he put the tongs in my throat and he says, oh, you've got your tonsils are swollen, but we can just remove them and you'll be singing like a bird. And I said, oh, well, okay. So we went through the surgery, came out and I was just so torn. I was disappointed, felt like somebody grabbed a knife, which they did and tore out my vocal cords because I couldn't sing a note for almost three years afterwards. During the time, Sam Kinsey, who was the, the man, he referred me to um, a, a voice specialist, uh, a, a piano player. Um, he was prominent in his own way. And um, he, I went to see him. He did the scale, la, 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 la,
And he said, there's nothing wrong with your voice, but I would recommend that you pick up a woodwind instrument. And I said, oh, okay, like what? He said, um, something without a reed, where you have a constant flow. I decided to pick up the flute and I took a couple of um, kind of lessons from actually somebody that was in the San Antonio Orchestra and he was real good, you know, and taught me a lot of tricks and stuff with the flute and it actually helped my voice and my breathing. So from there, I came back to the band with full strength and uh, they started doing yes and, and a lot of, um, oh, just a lot of more sophisticated um, rock, so to speak. But my edge wanted to be doing like um, trapeze. I love trapeze. Um, I loved Uriah Heep. I loved the heavier, questionable, but the vocals were high, strong, and powerful. And I, that's what I wanted to do. My wife said, there's some guy on the phone that wants to talk to you. Um, and um, his name is John. So for about two weeks, um, this guy was calling. It, it got to the point where my wife's standing with the phone outside the front door. I'm driving home from work at four. And she hands me the phone and she says, um, you know who it is. And I said, John? And he goes, yeah, he's calling you every day at four o'clock. And so I, I called him and I talked talk to him the first time. And he's, he said he was had in his heart to start a band and he was wanting to know if I would be the singer. And I said, well, who, who do you have in the band? And and he says, well, I've got Fern. And I said, Fern? Fernando? And he says, yeah, um, they're all, we're all Christian. We all love the Lord. And I said, but I had heard Fern chops off the heads of lead singers. And, and I said, there's no way. There was a uh, community PA system, a battery-operated one that ministers would go and, and jump in and start ministering and preaching and stuff. And I look way in the distance and there's a guy with what seems to be a guitar strapped to his back and he's way far. And as he's getting closer and closer and closer, this guy looks like Steve Perry. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's Steve Perry. And he brought his guitar and it was John. And John came and and we all, he joined in with his guitar and we're praising God. And at that time, a minister got up on the microphone and he got into a confrontation with one of the soldiers on leave. And they started I mean, they got into it. They started cussing at each other. And he said he was an atheist and this and that. And it got really, really <clears throat> loud. And um, I look over and John was crying. And I said to him, did I do something wrong? And he said, no, it's just that when I hear that kind of preaching, it is so wrong, it is, it's not right. And I said, I told him, I said, I, 
the thought came to my mind. I saw a river flowing and, and the words were, I've seen many whose rivers run deep, but not one like him. <laughs> Afterward, I told him, I'll jam. We'll get together. We'll do it. Manny, that right there is a good segue. We need to make mention for our viewers, friends out there, if you don't know the story, the John that Manny is speaking of is none, none other than John Vidari. Uh, he had the vision, Doug, Darth, correct me if I'm wrong, but John had mm -hmm. the initial vision. He was kind of the visionary for Paradox. And um, Fern, I would like to know, if you don't mind my asking, how did you meet John Vidari? It's a very good question. I'm glad you asked. Um, at the time, I had just been born again right around 1983. Actually, the day I got born again was December 4th, 1983. And I was going to uh, my mom's church, but they were going to a, a Pentecostal church. And let me tell you, that Pentecostal church was very legalistic strict not that i have anything against them because i learned a lot and they reared me in, in so many ways but uh every sunday i go there and they'd say well if you don't cut your hair and you look like the world going to hell i said okay and my hair was down to my waist man. <laughs> i love my my hair was full sure. now and I said, God, and I was, I was having a struggle. So I said, well, let me just wait. And then the next Sunday, every time I went there, if you don't, if you dress like the world and you have all these t-shirts that have all these crosses and all that, the devil and all this, you're going to hell. I said, wow, I got to change my apparel. So I went and I bought me a real nice white shirt, go to church on Sunday, and then the next week they said, well, if you're listening to all this kind of music. So every Sunday it was something going on. And I said, forget this, man. I, I don't think I, I don't think I'm saved. So I went. Uh, it was a Friday night. I went to this bar and it was called Tiffany Billiards. And prior to that, there was this friend of mine that was telling me, Fern, I want you to meet this guy by the name of John. And he's a musician. He, he's starting to play guitar. But he likes your playing. He's seen you before. And he wants to meet you. And I said, no. I said, her name was Glow. I said, you know what, man? I don't have time to meet other guys. I'm, I'm too busy, caught up in my own world at the time. I was trying to be saved and I was trying to get right with God, but I couldn't get right because I was always going to hell every Sunday. And I said, man, what am I doing? And I was trying to get my right, my life right. And one day. I went to this bar, it was called Tiffany Billiards, and it was a pool place, and I like to shoot pool, and I went, and I sat down, and I said, well, I'm, I'll wait for the table, when they call my name up, I'll go play pool, and I sat down, and I ordered me a beer, and right as I started to take the drink, this guy comes up to me, and he pokes me in the side, he says, hey, you're Fernando, right, and I said, yeah, and I looked at him and I said, who the heck is this guy? <laughs> and uh, he says, I'm John. I said, John. I said, hi, John. So I shook his hand. He says, I've been wanting to meet you, man. And I said, don't tell me you're John, the one I'm supposed to meet through my friend. He says, yeah, my name is John Badari. And right away, he grabbed the seat, sat right next to me. And then he says, um, he says, uh, there's an intervention going on here, he says, and I think it's the Lord wants me to talk to you. 
And I said, oh, no. And right away, I start pushing the beard back. I said, all right. Okay, I know what God's doing here. And he says, well, I want to start a band. And I want you to be the guitar player. In fact, he said, I seen you as a guitar player already in the band. I said, dude, and I told him, I said, dude, I don't even know you. What are you talking about? He says, well, the Lord wants you to be in this band. And you mean you're going to be in it. And this is before I had met Manny. And I said, well, man, I don't know, because I was already playing in another band called The Rock with this other band. It was a Christian band, but we weren't really doing anything. And uh, he says, I want you to come to my church because I told him, well, I can't because I'm not, I don't think I'm saved. And then he says, you're saved. You went, you gave your heart to the Lord. And I said, yes. He said, you're saved. So he started to convince me that I was saved. And I was convincing him that I wasn't because according to the preacher, I wasn't saved. So who am I going to believe, John Vidari or the preacher? So in this time, I was believing the preacher because he was the man of God. And then he says, well, come to my church on Sunday. So I, I said, all right, I'll go to your church. I didn't want to. I was kind of hesitant. I went to his church, and the guy playing the piano was a pastor. His name was Randall Parr, and it was called Randall Parr Ministries. And he was an ex-Elvis impersonator, but he sang like Elvis. I said, this guy can sing great. And he's singing all the hymns, you know, and I'm going, wow. So I, I, then that's when I met Liz, his wife, which was our photographer, but he wasn't married yet. And then uh, that's how I met him. Then he says, I want, he says, I want, I want to start playing with you. But I said, I can't play rock because it's all, rock is all of the devil. And I don't want to serve the devil no more. He says, no, man. He says, no. You can play Christian rock. And I said, no, man, there is no Christian rock. He says, yes, yeah, start listening to this, these bands. So he started giving me all these bands, like the Daniel Band, Blood, uh, Blood Good. And then he showed me a picture of Striper. And I said, man, these guys, I said, they look pretty heavy, pretty cool. He says, in fact, uh, next month, they're going to be at Randy's Rodeo here in San Antonio. And I want you to come. And I said, no, nah, man, I can't go because it's, that's not, that's totally ungodly. So I went, he bought me the ticket because he used to work at this other store. He bought me the ticket and he forced me to go. Basically, he forced me to go. I didn't want to go, but he forced me to go. He said, you're going, man. I said, all right, I'll go. Because he would bug me every day, man. He called me and called me and called me. And I said, man, this dude, this dude is worth with my my, my girlfriend, man, because he just keeps calling me and calling me and calling me and calling me. So I went to the concert, and before I went to the concert, he says, I want you to meet this guy by the name of Manny. And I said, Manny? And I said, yeah, Manny Castillo? I said, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, that guy's a great singer, man. He said, but he won't jam with me. He said, no, well, let's go meet him. So he went and he reintroduced me to Manny. I had met Manny before, you know, uh, prior to, to that, but I never really talked to him. And, and I was trying to stay away from Manny because I heard he was born again and he was a streak. And I said, nah, I don't want to be. At that time, I was totally lost. But that's how I met Manny and John. So basically, if I'm understanding correctly, John Vidari, he was kind of the one, the visionary, the one that got Paradox together. Was John the one that came up with the name Paradox for the band? No. Okay. We all... We were at Manny's house and uh, we had already started gone together with the Galicia brothers. And uh, we uh, said, we got to come out with a name. So we all, I think what it was, Manny, we all drew uh, sticks. Everybody and, had a different name and, and yeah. on a piece of paper. And I think we put it in a little bucket and the, the name that, that got drawn was going to be the name of the band. Um, I don't, I had a different, uh, name, but, um, and I don't know who put in paradox or, or I think Phil had said that he talked to a girl that gave him the name paradox and told him, this is, this is going to be the name me, of the band. I got to noticing some things about your all's band paradox. It was all kind of a family affair, meaning amongst you all and mm -hmm. We'll kind of get into some of that, but uh, 
uh, Phil and Ephraim Galicia, the Galicia brothers, and Phil's nickname was Thrill Phil, right? Right, Phil Thrill. And he was on bass, and then his brother Ephraim was on drums. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Ephraim was like only 15 at the time, and he just showed up with Phil for a practice and started wailing away on the drums. Is that right? Well, what happened was Phil, it was Phil, me, and John, and uh, we were playing in, in, in like in a band together. And then uh, they said, well, we're going to get Manny at vocalist. Step out of the dark, yes, you can see. Break loose from the corners and set yourself free. Bang your head tonight, raise your dead. Manny, tell us about how it happened that uh, that Ephraim became the drummer for Paradox. Okay. Um, it was, I, I think, maybe our third time together, and we were waiting for a bass player, or, or I was. And I asked John, I said, well, who's going to be playing bass? Because uh, I, had, I had a bass player that was a friend of mine from the church. And he says, oh, I've got a bass player, and he's coming in tonight, and so sure enough, Phil and Ephraim showed up and um, we were doing some striper, um, what was it, more than a man. Mm -hmm. And um, that that was kind of our um, song that we put it together with. And I love the song, in fact. But so um, the the there was a drummer that was a part of the praise and worship that we were doing in a previous band he left his drums he said hey i'm gonna leave my drums you hope you don't mind and i said no just they'll be fine you know don't worry and we got there and um um we didn't have a drummer didn't show up right so phil we were playing and phil kind of nodded to Ephraim. he says um, hey i hope y'all don't mind but Ephraim's my little brother he's been he's been playing right. um drums and he can probably you know sit it out with us so Ephraim gets on the drums and all of a sudden it's like he's a monster he's like this kid could play like everything we wanted what the only thing was he was 14 we celebrated his 15th with him you know so but he had the super long hair yes. and he he had the cutie cutie boy part and they were brothers and i thought wow what what more could you want this and then he broke uh, the drummer's sticks i was going like oh my god he's gonna know somebody jumped on his drums what was uh what was uh the drummer the, the drummer for striper what's his name robert sweet yeah he looked up to robert sweet and of course, like Robert and what's the guitar player's name for Oz, Oz Fox. So we had the same, but it was a bass player and a drummer, you know, which was the Galicia brothers. But they used to look, uh, Ephraim used to like Striper a lot. So we learned a lot of Striper songs because of them. Now, so that brings up, you know, we're talking about the Galicia brothers. And I'm sorry if I mispronounce, is it Ephraim? Right, is it Ephraim. Ephraim. Okay, I, I apologize for mis mispronouncing Ephraim's first name, but part of that family uh, family affair I was talking about with Paradox, am I mistaken, but Phil, the bass player, he, he actually designed these two album covers. Is that correct? Very yes. gifted. Very gifted. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> guys, uh, part of that family affair too. Now, Manny, I've got a note here. You had rehearsals in your garage, if I'm not mistaken. Now, were you still at home with your with your mom at the time, or did you get any neighbor complaints for Paradox blasted out of the the garage? No, it was me and my wife, and we had okay. recently bought a house, and uh, it was a two car garage. And of course, the car the cars don't fit in garages anymore. So, what else could it become but a jam room? So, yeah, um, and um, it was. 
quite useful at the time. But um, yeah, it was it was neat to be able to have some place to rehearse. That's that's just wonderful. <laughs> Some of the lyrics y'all were talking about Striper and the influence that they had, I, I guess, been on, on you guys. And it makes sense now. I noticed in Stand Up for Jesus, y'all, part of the lyrics, it says Striper's telling you and Blood Good's telling you. So I guess both Striper and Blood Good were influential, influential then to Paradox. It was it was very influential. Both me and John wrote it. And um, we were trying to make the point that that this is okay, that Striper's telling you about Jesus Christ, Bloodgood's telling you. Bloodgood came in concert and played at the Cameo Theater in San Antonio, and they all came to the house here, and we got to meet them. We got to, how they say, break bread with each other and <laughs> fellowship, and, and you kind of wonder, are they as for real as you are? Because I'm for real, you know, it's not a joke. This was a, this was a, a mission, uh, a calling, and, and John had, um, was the instrument that God used to put us together, and, and John prophesied quite a bit. He said, just wait and see, Bradita, you're going to see so many record contracts on this kitchen table that you're you're going to freak out as so many record companies are going to want us. And I said, that's pretty boastful. I, I, I don't know that we could foresee something like that to be. But he was he was he was right. And uh, before that, I think we'd been together maybe just a couple of months. And um, there was a music producer that called me on the phone. Um, and Craig Bellinger called and he said, um, I heard about the band through Phil and I'd like to audition you. I, I, I think if, if everything works out, I'd like to record you. So we were excited, you know, we had, we only had um, two or three songs, maybe Can't You See and um, Last oh, Race last race and something, something else. It Long was a live. three, was it a two song or three song? I think it was. It was two songs, but we had Long Live and we had already written Stand Up With Jesus. <laughs> so Craig came out and he was well dressed in a suit and we go like, wow, this guy's for real too. He came in, he listened to us a couple of songs and and uh, he didn't say a word. He just came in and, and we introduced each other. And then he said, okay, I'm, he left. And, and I said, uh, before he left, I said, what do you think? And he said, I'll tell you on Christmas day, on the 25th, I'll call you. I'm going like, wow, okay. Well, it was real close to Christmas. Christmas Day, he calls and he said, I think this band has a potential. And I'm thinking a local, popular local band. I'm thinking maybe, you know, uh, we get to record. And he says, you have the capacity of being an internationally known band. He didn't say national, he said internationally. I said, you mean like worldwide? And he said, yes, you have that capability. And I'm, I'm, I want to take you all to the studio. So we find ourselves at UAR studio um, with... Um, Marius Perron. Marius, Marius Perron. Um, we get him to, to pray with us. And he was like squirm real squirmish about it. And and now he's a he's a born again, spirit filled uh, man of God and runs sound at one of the biggest churches in San Antonio. Right there, Manny. I don't want to interrupt, but I do want to I want to segue into one thing real quick. Because Manny, you were talking about the gentleman who noticed you guys and was saying you all had 
this international potential, and I do not deny that one one iota. Doug, I would like to ask you and Darth too, at this time, when you saw Paradox, what was going on? What were you seeing? How were you affected seeing Paradox for the first time during the heyday of metal back? That's a great question uh, because it was kind of, it was really a thrill. I felt like I was, uh, had one of those ground view first floor views of something that was going to take off. There was something that was not signed. They didn't have the stamp of approval from a record label or a bank behind them that said, we're going to promote these guys to the world. But they had that, they had their own unique sound. They had skill players, Fernando, Manuel, and Phil Galicia were just incredible uh, at their at their positions. And so immediately, uh, I knew they were world class. And it wasn't like Ruler came out. It wasn't like, oh, this is a garage tape recorded on a jam box. You know, you can barely hear it. This was professionally recorded. But I felt like I was getting, getting uh, had something already. In their early years, they were, you know, a new band. But... Uh, they just had that pizzazz, that chemistry, that sound that uh, set them apart. I bet Darth would agree his first interaction with the band. Yeah. Yep. I remember picking up Ultimate Metal, um, had never heard of Paradox. Um, I was excited. I mean, there was some other compilations, not a lot, maybe just a couple other compilations that came out with Christian Metal uh, bands on it. And I remember hearing... Uh, Paradox, I you know, put in the CD and just started listening. And um, I believe the song listed on Ultimate Metal was Meet the King. I'm sorry, Ruler, but it was actually Meet the King. I'm not sure exactly what happened with that, if it was supposed to be the song Ruler. And then, but anyway, um, it it caught my attention real quick. <laughs> I was like, like Doug said, you know, sometimes you hear some of these demo songs and some of the other bands on ultimate metal you could tell just the quality it's like up oh, you know these guys didn't have a budget much of probably anything or i'd i'd be interested to hear these same songs with a good production um and some so, some guidance along there but uh when i heard meet the king i was like okay yeah this is this is different this is uh they're much more seasoned much more polished and at that time there weren't a whole lot of other christian metal bands um and you could tell that just the potential it's like wow okay um, out of all the bands on this compilation, uh, Paradox to me was was definitely one of the best cuts on there. And I immediately thought, I want to hear more. I, I want to hear more. And I probably through Heaven's Metal, first of all, um, I think you did something with them, Doug, first before we did it at White Throne. But just uh, the review of the cassette, I'm like, okay, I, I got to get this. And so that was my, my first take with Paradox. It's like, I want more. I, I want to hear more where this is coming from. So, One thing that's interesting about any band out there, uh, you know, like like a band or a sports team, they've got they've got their standout player, and uh, and rock and roll has always been about the electric guitar, from Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley onwards through the '60s and the heaviness of Cream and Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple, Black Sabbath and the advent of metal, and even when you know Heaven's Metal changed to HM and started covering a broader style of music. It was always central to the guitar. The electric guitar is the mainstay of hard music. And uh, the thing about Fernando as uh, he had his own tone, uh, was, was flashy on stage. You know, sometimes he would hit the whammy bar, his 17 inch whammy bar with his elbow. Um, he could put on a show visually and sonically and a uh, super humble guy, uh, Never heard him brag, um, but he was a standout player in a in a band full of standouts. I mean, the, the whole band was very skilled and talented. There wasn't a weak link in the band. Um, but having that that player that would be like, whoa, you know, like like Rush had Neil Peart, you know, all three members of that band are world class. But you've got this drummer that that just attracts that extra special attention. And so, you know, sorry to heap praise on you, Fernando. But uh, but that just a, a special nugget about uh, Paradox. You couldn't help talk about the band without talking about their guitar player, just like White Cross. You know, White Cross had a really cool singer in Scott Wenzel. It sounded like the Stephen Piercy of Rat. But 
the wizard of the, on the sixth string, Rex Carroll, stole the show. And Fernando, uh, you know, took the spotlight for the band very well. That was something really special about the band. I paid I paid Doug to say that because we're both big old cowboy fans, as you can tell. <laughs> well, you know, you were talking earlier, Manny, about Paige and Plant and all, and you know, in with with paradox to me as a listener, there is a when I say a Paige and Plant quality, you know, Fern, you're you're a dynamic lead guitarist, and Manny, your vocals absolutely soar. And what's something that I do appreciate about Paradox, you guys do have your own sound. Manny, you sound like Manny, which is a which is a wonderful thing, and I mean that as a the highest compliment. You don't sound like any other. You sound like Manny from Paradox. And Fern, you have your own style, and it's just wonderful. Um, I love the fact that you all blend what I call power metal in the vein of maybe, you know, maiden or priest or saint. But then you also have this commercial flair that comes in there. and like, oh, I, I can still hear that on the radio. You know, um, I love Paradox. Love you guys. I'd like to talk about, um, before we move on past Ruler and Manny, I'm going to get back into the fact of you all were in the studio and then you all had these offers on the table that John Vidari, in fact, said would be there. At this juncture, gentlemen, I would like to respectfully remember rhythm guitarist and band visionary John Vidari. Friends out there, if you don't know the story uh, from, from my research, that John had passed in a car accident in late 1987. Um, part of that family affair, as I was mentioning, that John and his wife, Liz, they did band booking. Um, they acquired the band fashion. Uh, Liz, I believe, uh, helped with photos and band choreography. Yes. Uh, so, gentlemen, if you all would, let's respectfully remember John Vidari. Tell me some things about John and his wife, Liz, and okay. about how it came to fruition that those offers were on the table for you guys. John was a, a visionary. He was a man of God. Um, he would tell me some bizarre things that I was like Doubting Thomas compared to John. He would say, you know, I see angels and they're higher than my ceiling. And I would always go underneath my breath and like, right, John, whatever, dude. You know, <laughs> always like that, you know. He said, no, you watch, man, you watch. He said, God's going to do all these miracles. One day, me and the Galicia brothers were at John's house, and John was very mechanically inclined uh, with, with cars. He loved working on cars. And he was giving uh, Phil. Phil was having some kind of problems. He was giving him a tune-up. And it was there, and it was kind of rainy, you know, drizzling. And he was bending over, look, working on the motor, and it was me, Phil, and Ephraim. We were just there looking at John, talking, whatever. And then uh, John says, uh, I need a wrench, but it's inside the house. Can one of you go get it? And Phil said, well, let me go get it. He said, it's right there. As soon as you walk in, it's right there on the left. Mm -hmm. Grab it, and I, I can sure use it. Sure enough, man, Phil runs over there, and as he's running, he almost slips, but he keeps running. And I said, man, well, it's raining, right? So he grabs the wrench. As he's running back, he slips and he falls flat on his face. I told Manny and Doug, I'm not sure, probably dark. He falls flat on his face on the cement because it was a sidewalk paved pavement. And Phil gets up on his knees like that, and he's on his knees. And blood is coming out of his nose completely. I mean, it's broken. You could tell because it was like that. And Phil was in pain. And Ephraim and I said, man, well, we got to get him to the hospital. Let's take him right now. And John gets up. He looks. He says, wait a second. 
he goes up to him and he grabs Phil because there, he grabs one of those rags and he says, Phil, come over here, brother. And he goes up to him and he says, in the name of Jesus, I command his, his nose to go back into place like it's never been broken. He said certain things like that. And then he moved his hand and he laid hands on him. And all of a sudden, he stops bleeding. And Phil goes, wow, I don't feel any pain. I don't feel nothing. And me and, and Ethan are looking at each other like, you know, like when everybody's all scared and all that, we're looking at each other and he says, hey, dude, did you just see what I did? <laughs> I, mean, I can't, believe, can't believe this. And John says, okay, let me grab the wrench. He goes back and he starts working on the car like if nothing happened. <laughs> he turns around and he says, all you got to do, brother, is have faith. Have faith. And he would do stuff like that. And I would say, wow, man, this guy is something else. So from that point on, I started believing what he started saying. That's how he was. And that's a, just one of many miracles that I saw that he did. I recall one Sunday, um, a pastor had said, go out and get the poor, bring in the, the hungry, and just... Um, uh, br bring them in, you know, bring them in. I'll buy them breakfast, you know, I'll just. So that Sunday, we were all a part of the praise and worship team. John was playing guitar. Fern was playing guitar. I was playing flute. I mean, we were having a, a blast. <laughs> well, Liz came in and uh, John's wife and John was running late. And uh, we were waiting and waiting for John to get up there. And, and he, he missed a part of the praise. Um, and lo and behold, John walks in. And there's about, I want to say, 19 homeless people. And Pastor Bud looks over and all of these downtrodden people came in and Brother Bud said, put them, told the ushers, let's let's put our our um, new visitors and put them in between everybody. So John had literally went and got a van, went downtown and picked up all these street people and said, do you all want breakfast? Then you have to come with me. Well, they piled in. And the whole church was infiltrated with with homeless, starving people. And um, all of a sudden, it came to the realization that these people were not freshly dressed. They weren't wearing coats and suits and ties with perfume. They were, um, you couldn't bypass the, the fragrance that they brought in with them. At that time, Brother Bud ushered, said, how many of y'all are brand new or visiting? Well, they raised their hands up and he says, I want to buy you breakfast. And he ushered them over to the side. But the point was, John did this and he did it out of his heart. And he ministered to everybody that God loves you no matter who you are, where you are, right where you're at. And and John was that that tool. He cared that much that he went and did that. And it just blew me away. Because we were like, well, where's John? You know, he's 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 missed our praise and worship here, you know. And for him, it wasn't even about that. It was about ministering to everyone. It was it was just an awestruck moment that only John could have done that. You know, we're thinking about uh, I've never met John. 
But in thinking about John's home going into life everlasting, with the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus. Man infer, and I can only imagine, and Doug and Darth, the good shepherd's there with his arms open wide. And he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and enjoy your master's happiness, and as you've done it unto the least of these, so, I, have... I uh, the Lord, Fern and Manny, and, and to John and Bill and Afraid, you all were vessels, and you all are still being vessels, and you're still touching haunts. And all glory to the Lord. And I hope that those who see this can see that the vessels that you all were and, and still are. That's all I know to say. I'm, I'm touched even now. You just met John. <laughs> I wanted to see if I, I, I have time to just to say a little story about John. If I yes, may. sir. Um, John would always come to my, I was working at this music store and it was called the Ghost of Music. And I repair guitars. I learned under Luthier, and we would sell instruments, fix them up, we'd sell them, whatever. It was mainly a repair store. And John would always come in all the time, right around two o'clock when he'd get out. He was working for a store called Joski's. And he would come in and he looked up there and he saw a guitar he liked. And it was a 12 string ovation. I'm not sure you remember the ovation, but they were very popular back in the 80s. And uh, he saw this ovation and he played it and he says, Oh man, this is a guitar that I want to use to praise God. I can already see myself, envision myself playing praise and worship to the Lord. I'm going to sing him a song. And he'd be there. He didn't care who was there. And he started singing and he started dancing like David. But he starts singing and start praying. And one thing about John, he didn't have a voice to sing that you would say that he had a great voice like Manny. But he could just sing in his own style. He would just sing away. He didn't care who was listening. He says, man, I'm going to praise God. He grabbed the guitar and just start playing it. He says, that guitar is mine, for him. I said, well, yeah, John, but you're going to have to buy it. And I think it had a price tag about Five ninety nine, six hundred, and back then that would be like two or three grand today. And uh, he says, "Well, you watch. The Lord's going to give me that guitar." And I said, "Yeah." And I said, and "Of course." I said, "Yeah, John, but you're going to have to come up with a pretty penny to buy that." And one day, Mister Acosta comes in and he says, "Fern, I need some money. We have no money. Uh, all this week, sell what you can. I don't care what you sell it for. If you, even if it's half price, sell it." sell it i need some money and i said all right and i said and right away i looked at the ovation guitar that john looked at he says well what about that guitar he says sell it i don't care give me 400 bucks from from 599 well, it's not half price but i said all right and then i called liz his wife and i said hey liz uh mr goes just selling this guitar for 400 dollars and it's John's birthday's coming up next week. And she says, well, I want to buy him that guitar for him because he keeps bragging about this guitar, this guitar, this, and this guitar, that. He says, but I don't have $400. I only have 250 And I said, well, let me talk to Mr. Acosta. Put the phone down. And I said, Mr. Acosta, will you take uh, Liz wants to buy the guitar for John? And he says, oh, that guy that comes here and is always playing the guitar and singing and all that and all that. And he says, yeah. He says, how much she have? She says, 250. Sell it. Get it. Wow. And I'm going, wow. And I called Liz. I said, Liz, come and pick it up. She says, Fern, I'll be there in 30 minutes. She came and she picked it up. And while we're putting it on the case, I said, you know what? We're going to play a trick on John. We're going to grab this old messed up ovation that's busted up completely, put it in a different case, and we'll give him this. 
So the whole band, I told Manny, I had told everybody, look, mm -hmm. we're going to play this trick on John because I wanted to get John. We were always playing tricks at me, you know, stuff like that with each other. I wanted to get him. And me and John were like this. We were best friends. You, you know, I love the guy. And uh, I said, all right, I'm going to get him tonight. So tonight we're there and it's John's birthday. And he's looking at all the presents, but he's looking at this big old box. And you can tell it's a guitar, but it's in a box. And he's looking at it and looking at it. <laughs> we're just dragging on the night. And we're cutting cake. And then we said, okay, John, it's, it's time for you to open up your presents. So we're opening up all the small presents. And then finally, we give him the guitar. And he's like a little kid, man, just opening up the case. And his eyes are like big, you know, he says, wow, it's a guitar case and all that. And at this time, at the same time, I had the, the guitar he wanted in the truck outside. And everybody's there because everybody knows what's what's going on except John. And once he opens up the box, he looks at the case. And it's an ovation case. And he looks he, right away. He turns and he looks at me and he goes, See, Fern, and <laughs> I said to myself, see, John, wait till you... <laughs> and he opens up the case and it's the guitar and it's all busted up. I mean, I'm totally, the whole top is cracked completely like somebody stepped on it. And he says, wow, man, look at this guitar. It's a great guitar. And he turns around and he says, hey, Fern, you can fix this, can't you? And I said, uh, I don't know, man. It's pretty, but does it? He said, you know what, Fern? The Lord gave you a gift, and you can fix it, my brother. <laughs> so he stopped me. And I said, wow, man. I said, I can't stump this guy. I can't do it. I said, hold hold on, John. I'll be right back. And I ran. I ran because everybody started laughing, you know, when he opened up the case. Everybody was in on the trick and the joke. And I come and I give him the guitar. And then he says, Fern, what's this? And I said, this is your present. Liz got it for you. He opens it up and it's the guitar. And it's like he had a tear on his. And he says, wow. The Lord. And he grabs it. And he starts playing. Turns around and he says, see, Fern. God is good. And look, he gave me the guitar. This is my guitar friend. And I'm going to worship him forever. And you hear that song when we wrote Psalm 25. Even though Roy is playing the acoustic, but by that time, John had already passed. But that was his vision. And he said, this guitar is meant to praise the Lord. And he started singing in front of everybody. And we, you know, we had a blast that night. But he really, he ministered to me again. Fern, I wonder, and that story blesses me. Just think if he would have went in that bedroom with the broken guitar and he came back out and he goes, what is this? And you said, I fixed it <laughs> with the brand new guitar. <laughs> Doug, did you did you leave just to change so you and Fern could be twinsies with the Dallas? Yeah, I've got two stars. My shirt's one better star than Fern. <laughs> My battery died. When I get the warning that says your battery's running low, you better plug in. I have about four seconds. <laughs> I got you. I got you. And I, I missed my four second opportunity. Well, guys, I'm looking at the time. There's still just a little bit of ground I'd love to cover. Thank you for sticking it out with us. Let's 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 rock on. I, I have to make mention really quick in 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 remembering respectfully remembering John. Beautiful tribute song to him, gentlemen. Sweet reunion on here, and 
Um, friends, if you haven't heard that song, check it out. It's for Power and Glory. It's a beautiful, as we as we say in the metal realm, a power ballad, but it's dedicated to John and just just beautiful. <laughs> now, guys, I'd like to ask. The talent was certainly there, and everything that John said came to fruition. Mm -hmm. You all had offers on that table, offers from REX, Frontline, Intense, Word, Star Song. And then when Johnny passed, if I'm understanding the story correctly, they retracted the offers. Why were the offers retracted? Was there no room for for kind of waiting it out a little bit and then and then talking it out? What what, what happened there exactly? We had um I don't know. It was such a somber, somber time. I mean literally the contracts just stayed there and we're wondering you know what's going on what are, what do we do now you know uh, we started getting letters from maybe one two of the con uh the contracts and they were leaning towards how is this going to affect your writing ability oh man we were we said, well, John was a major part of writing because when we started Paradox and we started writing our own material, the one agreement was that we weren't going to just give one person the glory for writing. It took my voice. It took Fern's talented guitar playing. It took all of us to make one song to give birth. And we didn't want to give any one person the glory when God's the one that put us together. Mm -hmm. So we all agreed that whatever's being put to the tape, whatever was whatever's being put to the table, I'm so sorry. Um, whatever's being brought to the table was going to be by paradox, given to us by God. Otherwise, we didn't need it on the table. So when, when the record uh, labels had decided to uh, relent on, on the contracts, then we um, uh, decided, you know, well, we need to come up with something quick and uh, to show them what, what our capabilities and so now we had been working on some of the songs that are on power and glory when we came out with power and glory it was it was a rush deal then all of a sudden oh yeah you know we want we want you and we want you in a in a in a desperate way uh so we started reading the contracts we actually went to an attorney charged us over 760 dollars to go through the, all the contracts, they wrote Frontline and asked for $52,000 up front. And Frontline called me and said, what are y'all doing? Why did you go to an attorney? And I said, well, because we didn't know what was going on. Uh, we had spoken with Les Carlson and Michael Bloodgood about Frontline, and it wasn't anything that we would have been really um that we didn't want to be a part of plus for me i keith green went to sparrow records and told him i want to give my music away at whatever anybody can afford if we sign up we're not going to be able to do that and i had called doug and i said is there any way that we can advertise uh ruler at whatever anybody can afford because what how much does how much money does a 11 year old kid have in his pocket maybe two dollars three dollars but for us it was enough and we started getting two dollars 11 i think the most we got was a 20 dollar bill and we were getting cash in an envelope and we were honoring that by sending it to them for whatever they could afford because people didn't want what you could buy off the shelf. They want what they can't, that nobody else has. 
and and God blessed that for us. So we didn't see any reason to sign up with any of them. One of the guys from Sacred Warrior, Rick, and I asked he, and he asked me how long did it take for y'all to record the wrath, and I said, to tell you the truth, fifteen hours. It. I called Byron Spears from Kingdom Studio, and he said I can do it. I'm tearing down the studio. I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, for four hundred dollars, I'll record whatever you want. And uh, and then the mix down, I'll do separate. And I said, well, OK, let's go do it. Because we had we had all the material and the songs for the wrath already complete. We, we were on a very, very tight budget. I think we had maybe 500 at the most in the kitty. And uh, we gave him the four. We we put together the wrath in, I think, three days. At, at the budget of five hours, 400 bucks. And then Fern um, did, did something miraculous because it was in the raw form, okay? That was just the, the tracks. Then we needed Byron to, to do the mix down because he did a great mix down on Power and Glory and we couldn't afford it. And he wanted um, quite a bit. So Fern... Go ahead and tell him, Fern. Well, the guy that was working with... Uh, um, Alan? Yeah, Byron Spears, which was... Alan used to work with me at Rock World Music, which used to go to the same church that I went to. And he says, hey, Fern, uh, I talked to Byron, and I can do the mix down for you, and it's going to cost you this much, about another 1000 or 1200 I said, wow. He said, but what I'll do, Fern, I noticed that I like one of your guitars there. And I said, oh, well, here we go. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> it was a black Zion guitar. He says, if you give me that guitar, I'll do it for free. And I said, oh, man, you really know how to hurt a guy. Because I love guitars, right? And he says, I said, all right. I said, you'll do everything? He said, I'll do everything from start to finish. So I gave him one of my prize Zion guitars. And that's what completed the rat at the time but i also wanted to give a plug to um to doug i haven't said anything but doug it was the lord really used doug to you know feel us at the time because we send him two songs uh and he did a small write-up and at that time doug's uh uh, magazine was about maybe five or seven inches tall. It, it was the yellow one. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> we used, and when we met Doug, we became very close friends. In fact, when we'd go to Austin, we were always playing football together. That's why we got both into the uh, cobbles and whatever. But it was Doug that the Lord used Doug to open up a lot of doors for us. And uh, because of Doug, we also came out on TV. He did a, a TV show uh, through Paragon Cable at the time. He interviewed us. And if you ever see, want to see Doug in a tuxedo, look at the video. And you'll see. I got to find that, Doug. I'm glad you brought it up. I can send you a link. I posted it on my YouTube page. But at the end of this video, if you have a link to it or one of those little stamps when they're, they're watching at the end, they can click on it to watch. But uh, Mike Connell, who was the drummer for the Noble Knights, who was another San Antonio metal band that Phil Galicia was in prior to Paradox, mm -hmm. he was getting married and he asked me to be his best man. So I happened to be in San Antonio that weekend. I had a tux that I'd rented and uh, I thought it was Rogers Cablevision that brought him in. It might have been called Paragon too, but they had a little stu a television studio. I went in there wearing my tuxedo and I introduced the band and uh, 
they played a couple songs uh, to, they lip synced a couple songs <laughs> with the music playing over the sound system. And then I interviewed them between songs. It was a lot of fun. I've seen it and it's glorious. You have to see this. It's amazing. <laughs> Just the tuxedo alone is worth, worth the view. I can't wait to see this. I think it's it's kind of cool that Manny mentioned uh, Doug Delaney. He he did have the biggest music booth at Cornerstone, and it was actually at his booth that I picked up uh, both the cassettes, both uh, Ruler and uh, Power Power and Glory, uh, at the booth there. And wow. um, he was he was a huge catalyst because he worked for Spring Arbor, helping unsigned independent bands get some distribution to bookstores. Uh, and I know that was a blessing, a paradox, but uh, this is kind of cool how you, you guys mentioned, you know, getting getting the product, product to Cornerstone. And that's where I picked up mine. These are not the original ones I just showed you because I loaned them to somebody and I never got them back. So the, the good news of Jesus went out to someone who stole my cassettes and that's OK. But uh, <laughs> I had to buy these on eBay years later because at that point it was like, is this music ever going to be released on CD? I mean, we had no promises. And so it was always the hope. So I picked up those on eBay, uh, paid a pretty penny for them, but it's kind of cool to have them with the J cards and all that. So uh, then when I remember, I, it was through Doug's Facebook page. I remember he did a little video and I know if, Doug, if you remember this one, but it was like an album flat and it said ruler and you're going out to like a recycle bin. And you're like, oh, Christian metal. And you threw it in your recycle bin. And that was just kind of like the precursor to like, oh my goodness, there's something coming out. There's something going to happen. And then obviously there was press releases through Retroactive that the first ones were done. And I knew about uh, The Wrath through Heaven's Metal. There was a full page ad in there. Um, but I saw it years later and I thought, oh, it's way too old. It was like 97. Yep. I think it was about 97. I saw the ad, but it, it was in a previous issue of Heaven's Metal and I just missed it. And I'm like, oh, well, that that ship sailed a long time ago. I'll never see that. And uh, it's just kind of cool how Retroactive came together and, and all these releases. And so it, it's cool to see the songs available worldwide. Again, you know, you guys did the mail thing through the cassettes, people could afford it, but it's really cool to see it now available through Retroactive and people who wanted, wanted the music, they can have it um, vinyl and CD. Uh, so it, it's really cool. Yes, it is. It is. And for people like me, I miss the whole ship the first time other than on underground metal and that's when i was first introduced to paradox <laughs> Friends out there, I'm going to throw out some names. Cross Force, Chosen Stranger, Armada, Soldier, and also among those, Paradox. Bands that were never uh, on a major distribution label, as we were talking about, but certainly bands that stand tall among their musical peers and in, in music and message. Uh, the talent certainly there. Such a brilliant band, Paradox, and all these other bands that I just mentioned um guys i'd like to ask really quick um i want to make mention really quick that is on this album there was a lineup change uh, the galicia brothers had uh, i guess they just moved on at that point is that right right okay. yeah go ahead Fern. no yeah um we uh on that album the one that you're holding the wrath um that was Recorded back in was it 89, Manny? 89? 89. 90, yes, Actually, 90, 92. Well, yeah, around that time. And um, 
it took 30 some odd years finally to for it to come into fruition you know but better late than never and um the galicia brothers at that time had already uh we had gotten roy and anthony when they left we were manny and i we were like on a limbo thing like man what are we going to do now but roy and anthony and john purdue we're going to the Bible study that we were at. And our pastor at the time, it was John Higgins. And it was uh, for a musician's fellowship. And that's how we met up with them. And uh, they were listening to our music. And then we put out the word that we uh, were looking for another guitar player, uh, bass player, drummer. And they were playing in, a, in another band called uh, Harkin, was the name of the band. And they decided to join up with us. And of course, the rest is history. Then uh, John left. He had some personal issues. And then we got Jake. And Jake did the recording. So a great recording. And Darth, would you like to say anything about this album? Because I noticed you're in, I noticed Doug had had write-ups in the other albums and Ruler and Power and Glory. And you're in, you got some stuff in this album credit to you, Darth. Well, um, it just, it, it goes back, Doug was there at the more the beginning of the Paradox years. I built a relationship with Paradox in the last four to five years, um, just as a fan, uh, hoping the music would come out. And so um, both Ruler and Power and Glory came out, and then I knew that the Wrath was out there. So I kept on trying to bug Matt at Retroactive, hey, when's the Wrath going to come? When's the Wrath? And then kind of seeing things had stalled. And so I was talking to Fern, and I would talk to Manny, and um, I just kept, I, I was really pesky. And so um, I'm also really good friends with Bill at Rocks. And so, um, you know, it was the question of, you know, it, is Matt still interested in, in, in seeing the rap come out? If he's not cool, then maybe someone else would make it happen. I was just I'm like, this just has to get out there. So I was pesky. And then um, I think Manny and I were talking one time and and uh, then finally Manny said, hey, you know, got a hold of Matt. It looks like it's gonna go forward. And uh, so uh, I've got some pictures. I took pictures uh, for White Throne 89 um, at, Cor uh, at Cornerstone 89. And so we, we put some of those pictures are in there, uh, some of the live photos. Um, and so that was cool. Again, I, I, when I went to Cornerstone 89, at the time I signed up to go with the magazine, I didn't know Paradox was going to be there. But when I found out they were on the, the new band showcase, I was really, really excited. And that was quite the new band showcase, by the way. It was Paradox, Exalt, Iron Wrath. Um, let me see who else was there. a band called revelation. And then there was one other band that's escaping me right now, but there were six bands. And, um, uh, one of the things that paradox, uh, exalt got the record contract through pure metal, but paradox came in second place, I guess, whatever. But then you guys got two songs on two compilation albums, um, because of that. And there was one called brave new world. And uh, you guys had a song on that. And then there was a, a secondary one, I think. Was it Big remember. Rage? Big Rage, volume one. There we go. Thank you, my friends. But yeah, so it was kind of cool. That there was two songs out there. And then both of those recordings have also ended up as bonus tracks on the first two retroactive uh, releases of Ruler and Power and Glory. So, um, but the cool thing about The Wrath is there's some stuff that came out that I had no idea. I'm kind of a, again, kind of a connoisseur going back for years. These lost tracks um and so uh, the parable i think is one on the wrath that i'd never heard of i think that's what it's called but that was cool to see and then uh yeah some other ones uh, that came out so anyway it's just cool it was it was glad to be i was a small part of the wrath but uh that was just because i was being pesky yeah cult uh there was call to obedience and oh, yeah. uh, call to obedience i was just listening to tapes that were in the storage and i thought why didn't we ever record this? And it was we 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 had a setup at at the church, uh, and we were randomly recording songs, and that was one of the songs that was left or or, or forgotten or overlooked. And uh, we kind of wish we could have recorded it officially, you know.
after Phil and Ephraim left, um, we were left without an artist. And so um, we put out, or Doug put out the word that we were looking for an artist. And and um, uh, George Wright was a young kid and, and he said he would like to try out. And I, I said, or not try out, he said that he would like to have a part of it. And I, I said, well, all I can say is, is this is the theme, which is the sword and, and the snake and um, the sword being the word of God. And, and he got it. He was he was a Christian and and he. Uh, he, he I gave him the, the song so that we had just finished recording the wrath. And um, I, I said, we can't pay you, but we'll sure give you recognition. And his 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 little art company was called the right stuff and and it felt right to me and when he sent me i you can see right here i don't know if you can see it but there's yeah. the artwork mm -hmm. it's the full-blown 18 by 18 and later on i i read a um, an article that he did and he said he made the biggest mistake was to give up the artwork and i want to make sure he gets this back because it's well deserved. He did it. It's not mine. It's his, and and he came out with the perfect interpretation that the music could have possibly have have needed or used. So Fern and uh, Fern and Manny, while we're we're kind of heading toward the toward the end here, I do want to ask you really quick, both, and then Manny, I have one last question for you. So Fern and, and Manny, with regard to the wrath getting to come out and see its completion, do you feel like things have kind of come full circle for you that everything's been out now and and in a nice package and kind of given the deluxe treatment that it so rightly deserves? Do you all feel a sense of completion? Um, uh, go ahead, Fern. I was going to say for me, yes. Mm -hmm. Um I think that um, we've been doing it for a long time, since uh, 85, 86. And in between that time, we broke up and then we got back together. We could have written a whole lot more music. But, you know, with all the things going on, you know, and then recently, these past years with COVID and all that, mm -hmm. and, you know, it just took a toll on a lot of people. But uh, just like the wrath finally came out, so I was satisfied to see it come out and get the credit that it did. Um, and just to give God the glory and everything, you know. But that would be for me. How do you feel about it, Manny? It finally kind of gave him the deluxe treatment that it so rightly deserved. I think it's it's been an adventure. You, you haven't even heard all of it. It's um, it's so much that happened that I, I was telling Doug that that this this is the beginning of a book. This is the beginning of a movie that people sh should see because simply because of a man who did what he was called to do. And then God called him out of nowhere away from us. And then we had to stand up and follow the vision that he had left. I feel that it's complete. You know, we did have, we, we got back together in 2015 and, and started writing. We have enough to do another release if there's, um, I mean, we feel like we need the um, the limousine service recording, not the, sure, sure. Uh, like when I talked to Rick, he said, do you know how long it took us to record what we did? And he, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, 2,000 hours compared to our 15 struggling musicians because we stood up on our belief in what we knew to be true and had to follow it but we have enough music 
that would probably blow doors again, and and that would be the return. But we can't be doing what we've been doing and just struggling. I would like to call out Pachyderm, Gino, and the elephants because of the work that they've done. If I had a choice, I would do. I would. I would encourage everyone to um, call on them for the final release, which should be called the return, the final, the final message. Manny, you're looking at four people, you and Fern, that uh, I, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I'd be willing to say that I certainly, I mean, Rex and I, we, uh, you and Fern and everybody in Paradox have our respect. Doug and Darth have our respect. There are bigger brothers that were there doing it before us and everything. And um, But I can only imagine right now that there are four people here that you and Fern are looking at that you've touched each one of our lives in some positive manner. And uh, I would just like to say thank you for that, for being the vessel that you and Fern are. So thank you and Fern and everybody in Paradox. And I'd like to ask one last question and then we'll have, uh, we'll let Doug and Darth uh, have some, their comments and then we'll have a quick message from home. Manny, a quick question that I, I would like to ask you, if you don't mind. Uh, you have a touching uh, poem uh, from June of 2020, and it's dedicated to John, and it's entitled, I Remember You. There was one line in there that I'm especially, especially curious about. Uh, and you said, we sang our songs way up high, got hit in the face with a whipped cream pie. So I'd like to ask you, Quickly, if you don't mind, tell me the story about this whipped cream pie. What happened? <laughs> well, <Burns> we, were, <laughs> we were at Hank's High School uh, touring with Sacred Warrior. And um, it came, I mean, the guys are great. I mean, they were so much uh, fun to be with. They gave us a side of the ministry that uh, you can laugh, you can have fun. And and you can play trick jokes on on each other in the in the name of the Lord. And um, for instance, I think uh, Ray came up and he said, uh, "Brother man, you played, you sang great tonight." And he said, "Put it there." And he had honey in his hand. <laughs> so I'm shaking hands with somebody smothered with honey on my hands, and I'm going, "Okay." This this will work. <laughs> I understand. So we were at Hank's High School finishing up our set. Um, and I think it was the last song, You, you Must Be Saved. And it was a miracle to play for a, a, a high school back then. You know, the door was open. The, the whole, they, they had the whole school in there. It was an assembly. Uh, how we got in there... I don't know, but we did. At the last note, you must be saved. You must be saved. <laughs> and it, I could hold that because for me to hold a note, <clears throat> my impression is to reach through the clouds and touch the hem of, of his garment. So once I touch the hem of his garment, holding my breath is irrelevant. So I'm I'm touching the hem of, of Jesus' garment when I got hit in the face with a cream pie. I I didn't even know I got hit until I came down with it <laughs> with it all over my face. How do you take that? I said, I have never heard or seen anyone get hit with a pie on the face 
uh, as a as a singer, an artist on stage, I I said, man, this is cool. <laughs> so who who did that, Manny? Who 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 did that to you? That was that was it. Nobody was saying who did that. Nobody was saying who did that. Or we won't tell <clears throat> Manny who did it. I know who did it. Years think... later. Years was... later, um, Joe Loera was my room and buddy. When we toured with Sacred Warrior, we were separated and each one of us were received a designated partner. Joe Loera was the the stage sound engineer. He was the gentle giant. He was tall and he had his long hair. He was cool. And um, I, I, I would ask him and I was wondering who was it? I always thought it was Ray for like two years or so. And one day Joe sent me a picture and it was him. It was smoking Joe Loera hit me in the face with a pie and and i thought it's you you're the i can't believe you would have done that and he goes brother who else would have done it and i thought well ray and he goes no it was me and about almost a year two years now joe loera passed away He called me up from his dying bed, and he says, I'm going to miss you. I think Fern talked to him also. We were all able. His wife let us talk to him. He had a heart failure that led to other complications, and he said goodbye. Great guy. I mean, uh, we were at Meteoras downtown, <clears throat> He was driving a brand new Cadillac or something like that. We were driving, he was driving, and absentmindedly, some guy walked in front of him and slammed his hand on Joe's hood. And there was going to be a confrontation. Joe got out of his car, stood up, a giant of a man, and that guy ran when he saw Joe. That's how he was my big brother. When I was with him, there was no fear of anything, you know, but he went to be with the Lord uh, recently. Amen. Fern, we're going to head toward closeout. Would you like to say any, any last uh, remark or share anything before we let Doug and Dark do so? Well, I just want to thank Darth uh, for uh, sending us uh, material that I didn't even know was out there, videos. I recently saw the video that we did in 89 at Cornerstone, and now I know where that, I was wondering where that, that beat came on, on uh, You Must Be Safe on the Rat. And it's that video on the rat that we did at Cornerstone. So I want to thank him for that. And of course, my brother, Doug, uh, I just think the world of him. I tease him a lot, but I love him because, you know, he's uh, he's been there since day one. You know, Doug's been there. You know, he he helped us. He's, he's seen us through good times and bad times, but he's a good man of God. And recently with you all, now that I've met you all, I just think the world of you all. And I'm glad that the Lord opened up the door for this. I'm sure me and Manny think that, you know, of you all. That's all I would have to say. And praise God and give Jesus the glory, the honor, the praise that he deserves. You know, can't do it without him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Doug? Amen. Kent, uh, thanks so much for uh, putting this all together and doing what you do. And I want to support you any way I can. Rex, you too. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you. And Austin, I went to the University of Texas in Austin, and I went to the Mother Earth Club once, maybe twice. 
And I happen to think I may have seen your band, Manny. I remember seeing a progressive rock band. I think they played Uriah Heep and Yes and Jethro Tull and maybe Kansas. I don't know. But uh, it's a long time ago in 81, 82, 83. Uh, I give Manuel Castillo credit for teaching me to appreciate coffee. I was in his kitchen one time and he said, the way to enjoy coffee is to make it not taste like coffee. And first you put in a bunch of creamer and then you put in some honey and then you put in some chocolate or cocoa mix. And, and he taught me to appreciate coffee. And uh, coincidentally, not too long after that, I would be doing Heaven's Metal magazine and I would have a deadline and I would brew a whole pot of coffee. And I would drink that whole pot of coffee and stay up all night and work on Heaven's Metal magazine. And uh, um, after about a month of that, I went to the doctor for some chest pains and uh, uh -oh. they thought it might have been uh -oh. ulcers. But it turns out my uh, gallbladder uh, went bad and I had to have my gallbladder removed. So I don't know if that's related or not, but it sure is a coincidence. I was drinking pots of coffee and then less than a month later, I had to get my gallbladder taken out. <laughs> uh, it and should have been cappuccino. Seen, yeah. <laughs> I want to say I've seen the whipped cream pie photos in the pages of Heaven's Metal. I don't know if it, it, it reoccurred at the Exodus Festival or not, but I'd be curious if that if that happened. Um, but I just I got don't... nothing but uh, good things to say about Paradox. I'm friends for life with them. Uh, it's the kind of guy I am, I think, when I when I meet somebody uh, <clears throat> and become friends with them. It's like a lifelong friendship, and I've really enjoyed uh, your fellowship and friendship over the years. I thank you for the prayers at different times, uh, getting a phone call and just having somebody to lift me up and encourage me and pray for me. And uh, I'm glad uh, that God saw fit to uh, put paradox on this earth because uh, I certainly got a lot of joy and edification out of that. I just appreciate the opportunity to be on with you guys. Uh, it's great to know uh, friendship, even though some of us have never met face to face. It's just been fun to, to walk through the journey of music and faith together. Um, and with Paradox, uh, I've been along on the journey as, as a fan of their music from the beginning, but just in the last few years, three, four years of getting to be actual friends, talking to Manny and, and to Fern. And I was pretty sick with COVID back in 2020 and, 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 uh, Fern called me and he said, Hey man, I, I just need to pray for you. I, he was driving somewhere and he pulled over and uh, Fern was just praying for me, just knowing I was having a, a pretty big struggle. And so um, again, just that, uh, you know, more than the music, we love the music. The music plays an important part um, in our, in our friendship, but even beyond that is just that camaraderie and that, that, that uh, brotherhood of the Lord that, you know, Fern, you know, would say, I need to pray for you, Darth. And so I appreciate that. And, and Manny, he and I've talked many times on the phone and just reminisced and just that encouragement that's come from our conversations and stuff. So appreciate the friendship, appreciate the music. Um, but you know, all of us one day, we're going to shed these temporal bodies and we will be with the Lord and I'll get to meet John and uh, know the story. Um, but the most important thing is we'll be with the Lord. And so uh, that's our ultimate goal is to know Jesus and to spend eternity with him. So it's kind of full circle. Uh, love hearing the the stories and the laughter. And I've heard many more stories than what we had time to share about today. But uh, again, just that that camaraderie and that friendship and appreciate the opportunity to be on today with, with you all here. And uh, thanks again. Amen. Amen. Rex, any closing things you'd like to say to our friends? Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to admit I'm, I'm kind of late to the paradox game, um, uh, you know, and, and we never saw them live, you know, in, in my area. But um, you can just tell it was based on ministry and and, you know, what's really important. And so um, I just want to thank Fern and Manny for coming on and appreciate their time and spending way more time than what we originally uh, allotted. And so thank you so much, guys. And um, just continue uh, what you're doing. And God bless you both.
Mm -hmm. Amen. Can I say something? Um, sure, Manny. In in closing, or um, John and me would would sometimes we'd share a word here or there, and he came up to me and and um, shared this word, and I wrote it in my Bible, and to this day it's still there. Um, I'm kind of a hoarder. I don't get rid of Bibles. They just grow in the shelves. Attempt something so impossible that unless God is in it, it is destined to fail. And I wrote that in my Bible when he read it to me. And he said, you'll see what it means one day. And that's attempt something so impossible that unless God is in it, it is destined to fail. So I, I think we, I would hope to God we didn't fail. And the fruit is what um, we understand is proof. So. Well, Manny and Fern, thank you, Doug and Darth, thank you, gentlemen. And uh, we always, um, we do like to keep the main thing, the main thing here, and that's the Lord's word. Um, was it Fern, you or, or somebody said, unless the Lord's in it, you know, it's it, with, without him, we can do nothing, you know. And um, anyway, the message from home today is the scripture. Uh, it's kind of a twofold scripture. One is, uh, it's it's frankly the paradox scripture from John. 1225, that's what the paradox was about, where Jesus, Yeshua said, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal uh, for eternal life. And elsewhere, that also reminded me of, of Yeshua, of Jesus' words in Matthew 16, 25, for whoever wants to save his own life will destroy it, but whoever destroys his life for my sake will find it. And you know, coming back full circle and kind of what you were saying, Darth, you know, um, and Doug, you also said it. That's a promise from Jesus. Whoever destroys his life for my sake will find it. The beautiful thing about, well, number one, that's a promise from the Lord Jesus. You will find it if you live for him. John Vidari knew the Lord Jesus. We know the Lord Jesus, and God told us in his word also that he's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And John Vidari knew the God of the living. And Jesus gave us that promise that you will find your life if you lose that life in this world that we're bound in this mortal coil. Doug, you said it was a lifelong friendship with the members of Paradox, and we do have that lifelong friendship, each one of us. We might not all be face to face here, but we have a lifelong friendship of everlasting life, which will be everlasting lifelong. That makes sense. And amen. as we all can agree on, amen, because it's all possible. Amen. Because of the Lord Jesus, the King above kings and the Lord above lords. And I'm just thankful for his grace. I'm thankful for each one of you, for the brothers that we have here and the friends. And um, I'm just blessed. All glory to King Jesus. Amen. 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 With that said, we'll wave goodbye, friends. We love and appreciate each one of you. Love you. Bye.